On the second day, we reached Conatup, in a dense swarm of troops looking for transport. Our group moved to the southwest to meet a strong Russian army. We had been supplied in town under the horrified eyes of the commissariat officers, who had to give us the gas they had been saving for their own personal use. Twenty minutes later, we were in contact with advanced Russian elements, which surprised us. In town, our soldiers were busy with odd jobs, like repairing bicycles. Our tanks were briefly engaged and then withdrew on orders. We drove for the rest of the day to reach a point where, according to plan, we should have been supplied. We arrived at the dump just a few minutes before the engineers blew it up. An enormous silo filled with tin cans, drinks, and foods of all kinds was about to be burned. We stuffed our pockets and every cranny in our trucks with everything we could grab, but we had to leave behind enough to feed the whole division for several days, and the flames consumed precious provisions which would have made a great difference somewhere else. Hals watched the silo collapse with tears in his eyes, cramming as much food into his mouth as his stomach could possibly hold. The whole company witnessed the scene with regret, puffing on the cigars we'd been able to save. Then we had about six hours rest before returning to business. During this time, the Red Army entered Konotop, and the German forces withdrew, fighting hard as they went. Our group thrust violently into the south wing of the Russian offensive, and once again our tanks opened a passage for us through the enemy reserves, which scattered before our guns were ready to fire. However, that evening the Russians turned away from the town and concentrated their efforts on us. Our tanks made a half turn, and left six of theirs in flames. All the guns we'd brought with us were prepared to fire and I saw our famous rocket launchers go into action for the first time. Commanded by Captain Wes Radal, our company and two others were used to protect the left wing of an armored detachment. Some of our fellows squeezed onto the platforms of the motorized Geschnaus. The rest tramped along behind the machines, which proceeded at more or less a normal walking pace. It is strange how often the sense of having the initiative can lead men to confront an enemy far stronger than they. The progress of our panzers had seemed so irresistible during the last couple of days that everything seemed possible to us. Our three companies, in groups of thirty, tramped through the relatively cool night among the ragged stands of brush scattered across this part of the plain. From the near distance, the roar of our engines filled the air, giving us a sense of reassurance, and, we hoped, a proportionate sense of alarm to the Soviets who were trying to intercept us. From time to time we could hear shots, which were undoubtedly intended for the shadowy figures fleeing through the brush. We went on in this way for about two miles, until suddenly we were surrounded by flares, shooting upward and throwing their light onto the ground all around us. Everyone, that is to say every one of our eight hundred souls, plunged down in a single movement. Our steel helmets, which in theory had a dull finish, glinted in the flashes of brilliant light. In no time the armored cars had turned back into the brush, their formidable barrels swinging silently in search of a moving silhouette. We braced ourselves for a shower of missiles from the Russian bomb throwers, instantly aware of the shrinking sensation which comes with bad moments. Two violet German flares shot into the sky. We knew that this was the signal to advance. After a moment of surprise and hesitation, we began to crawl forward, taking every precaution. A few men stood up and advanced bent double. Most of the Russian rockets had already landed and we took advantage of the lull to make a leap forward. I reached a small hollow edged with low scrub. A moment later, two companions caught up with me, and the sound of their quick loud breathing betrayed the nervous tension knotting their throats. There is nothing more terrifying than moving at night through a piece of wooded or bushy country, in which every shrub might release a sudden flash of white light to dazzle and blind a moment before the intense pain which could mean the end of life. There was no way of keeping our progress silent, and for an invisible Russian waiting with his finger on the trigger any moment might present an ideal opportunity. However, everything remained more or less quiet. The enemy, who must have been very close to us, decided to stay hidden and kept us in a state of prolonged tension. We continued to advance, slowly and cautiously. My temples throbbed and my body was taut, ready for the plunge which might be necessary any minute. We heard a voice some twenty or thirty yards to our left, and the three of us shoved our noses into the dry grass. For a moment, we thought we were finished. I fitted my Mauser into the hollow of my shoulder with my eyes screwed up, anticipating the first shot. However, nothing more happened. On the left, where we'd heard the noise, two Russians had just surrendered to some of our men. A short distance in the other direction, 
The same thing happened. We couldn't understand it. What could have been happening inside the heads of these men who'd been ordered to intercept us? It's anybody's guess. Maybe they thought they were cut off from their main body of men and were afraid. For at that time, when the spirit of vengeance was the rule, the Russians were just as afraid of us as we were of them. We even thought we might have fallen into some kind of trap. An hour went by before we were ordered to regroup. During that time, our tanks went back into action, and as we silently withdrew, the flashes of their guns lit our faces with glimmers of pink light. We climbed into our trucks and started off again, apparently in the same direction as before. Dispatch riders whirled busily around our group of heavy transports. About two miles ahead, the tanks were apparently pushing back an enemy who was putting up only a feeble show of resistance. In these circumstances, the first light of dawn fell over our column, or rather columns, for we were out of line by as much as 500 yards, both to the left and to the right. During the night, our forward troops had been firing continuously. Ahead of us, through a veil of fog, we could see a town whose name I no longer remember. The motorized troops of the Gross Deutschland were fighting through streets, lined with houses with tightly closed shutters. Our vehicles moved slowly forward, with soldiers walking on either side, holding their guns, and ready for anything. We came to a small square, where a group of vehicles which included two ambulances had stopped. About thirty Russian civilians were standing under guard beside one of the houses. We kept straight on. At the edge of town, we passed several tank crews patching up minor damage. The miserable shacks all around them were on fire. We stopped for a moment and stared at what was left of these wooden straw hovels. There was no sidewalk, no orientation or alignment of the buildings. This place, like the outlying districts of innumerable Russian towns, looked like an oversized barnyard. Watering troughs or prekas obstructed without any rhyme or reason, passageways which might eventually be turned into streets. Villages buried in the wilds of the steppe seemed more attractive, with their clusters of izbas turning their backs to the north. The outlying districts and even most of the town centers I saw, with the exception of Kiev, were of an incredible dreariness. We had stopped above all to wash and get water, and we knew we had only a very short time. Some men beat their clothes against trees or the sides of buildings, as if they were ambulatory doormats. Others drenched themselves with water from the priyakas or wash troughs, although the day was cool and a damp wind boded no good. Nonetheless, we were frantic with thirst from the dust stirred up by our machines. German water bottles are small, so we took along extra water in anything we could find. Next joined and encouraged by the veteran, we climbed over a low wall surrounding a small orchard. The branches of the nearest tree were weighed down with masses of skimpy, unripe pears, which refreshed our parched mouths even though they were hard and sour. We were busily picking them when a Russian popped up, like a jack-in-the-box. He had summoned up the nerve to come out of his house, carrying a kind of bowl of braided straw full of pears like the ones we were nibbling. He jabbered a few words to the veteran, who had gone over to him. His white face was trying to smile, but was only able to manage a stiff and desperate grin. His eyes were glued to the straps of the veteran's gun belt, which crossed his chest, and especially to his spandau. Dave, said the veteran, reaching out a hand. The Russian held up the basket, from which our friend took a pear. He threw it away and took another, which he also rejected. This was repeated some five or six times. Then the veteran began to shout at the Popov, who backed away with nervous little steps. They're all half rotten, roared the veteran as he came back to us. The Russian, hoping to save his orchard, had offered us the putrefying fruit he kept for his pig. As soon as we realized this, we shook the tree, which filled a tent cloth. The Popov disappeared into his lair. We could hear guns to the northwest. Our advanced troops must have made contact with the enemy. We were ordered to move out. Half an hour later, we climbed down from the trucks again. The Feld's whistle was blowing for combat readiness. Fighting was in progress about half a mile away in a small village built round a factory. Wes Dow quickly explained that we had to neutralize a large enemy force which was holding the place. Two companies had been detached for the job. The rest of the group would keep moving. With our guns slung, we walked toward the village while our tractors pulled our rocket launchers and anti-tank guns into firing position. Almost immediately, the Russians, who were watching from their trenches, showered us with a rain of shells. 
If their aim had been more precise, it would have been the end of us. As it was, their only effect was to make everyone run for cover. Our two companies spread out and partly surrounded the fortified point. Then we had about ten minutes of quiet while our captain, sheltered behind a pile of stones, discussed the forthcoming action with his subordinates. The noncoms rejoined us and told us what positions we should try to reach. We scanned our surroundings as they talked, observing with our combat sense, which by now was quite well developed, every fold and hollow which might offer some shelter. Everything was quiet and the instructions seemed ludicrously easy. Nothing was moving and the silence would have been total if it had not been for the vehicles of our armored group bumping along the rocky road below us, filling the air with exhaust and deafening noise. The Russians kept quiet and many of us thought they had already been knocked out. The immediate presence of our main body of troops reassured us, and it seemed likely that the approaching fight would be no more than a skirmish. We were ordered to move out and from every nook and cranny troops proceeded toward the village, bent double. Here and there we could hear someone laughing and wondered if it was innocence or bravado. Our men reached the first houses. The Russians remained silent and invisible. I had just joined my group, which included Hal's, the dear friend who so often saved me from feeling completely lost. His innocent, good-natured face smiled at me from the crowd and I smiled back. We exchanged a look which said a great deal more than many long conversations do. The war seemed quite different to us now that we had an aerial escort. Our terrible memories of the Don and the retreat from Belgorod belonged to the past and to bad times, which wouldn't come back. Of course, we knew that the war wasn't over, but for the last week we had been making the enemy run. We were watching the progress of about 30 of our men who were leaping through the ruins of a brickworks. Five or six Panzer Grenadiers were running along beside the principal building. One of them had just thrown a grenade through a gaping window. A moment later, the air was shaken by its explosion, which was immediately followed by a heart-rending scream of a kind we had often heard before. We knew that that nothing must distract us from our objective, however. We saw a human figure dressed in white fall from the window and roll down to the feet of our soldiers. It was a Russian civilian, a woman who had been cowering beside the window, probably praying to all the saints. In spite of her fall, she seemed to be unhurt and ran toward us, screaming. One of our soldiers lifted his gun, and we thought we heard it fire, but nothing happened. The Russian woman in her white shirt ran screaming through the ranks of petrified men. No one said a word, and for a half minute the war seemed to be standing still. Our grenadiers had already kicked in the door and were in the house. Three other civilians came out, two men and a child. Once again we watched as they ran through our astounded ranks. The Russians had not evacuated the village, and we would have to take the civilian population into account. Wesre Dao, who had just realized this, installed a loudspeaker on a half-track, which drove between the rows of houses waving a white rag fastened to a pole. The loudspeaker crackled out some nasal Russian words, while the four men on the half-track looked desperately at their comrades who had remained in shelter. The loudspeaker must have been giving the Russians a chance to evacuate civilians or to lay down their arms, but the half-track had gone less than a hundred yards when the irreparable occurred. It suddenly seemed to fly upward as a series of deafening explosions rang out and five or six huts disintegrated. The truck had driven over a minefield. A heavy cloud of dust and smoke hid the village from our eyes. We could see two black silhouettes gesticulating in the flaming half-track and hear them screaming. Look out for mines, someone shouted, but his voice was drowned by the roaring of mortars and packs as the ground in front of us burst into geysers of flame and earth. Thatched roofs flew off in one piece, leaving the houses exposed like bald men who've lost their wigs. The Russians reacted using at least two batteries of heavy howitzers. Every shell landing within 150 yards of us made the ground shake under our feet and sucked the air from our lungs. Despite the almost certain presence of mines, the assault whistles blew. Everyone left shelter and ran for the nearest embankment. Our mortars pounded the ground some 30 yards ahead of us to disrupt the arrangement of mines and, if possible, explode some of them. The Russians, with multi-barreled machine guns set up on trucks, poured a devastating fire on everything they could see. What had seemed so simple only 15 minutes earlier now looked impossibly difficult, and suddenly no one felt confident. 
There were five of us hiding in the rubble of the brickworks, and our faces, pressed into the ground, knocked against the dirt with every explosion. From another heap of shattered bricks, a non-com was shouting at the top of his lungs to fire at anything we could see. One at a time we risked looking out, but the whine of shells made even the boldest duck down immediately. Only our mortars and rocket launchers kept on firing steadily and profusely at an enemy who, for the moment, had the upper hand. In the distance, the metallic factory tower we had noticed when we arrived was proving curiously resistant to our pox shells, which must have passed right through it at several points. Once again, we had to jump to a more advanced position. Some men were shouting to give themselves courage. Others, like me, ground their teeth and clenched their sweaty hands on their guns. Less from emotion than from a reflex akin to that of a drowning man hanging on to a rope. Accompanied by deep or shrill sounds and brilliant or fading light, the earth flew up all around us, sometimes engulfing pathetic human figures dressed as soldiers. About thirty yards away, on our left, five of our men who had hidden behind a small wooden building like a blacksmith's shed fell one after the other. The last two had no idea where to run, and looked frantically for the enemy who would presently knock them off too. Finally, they threw themselves down among the bodies of their companions. A thick stream of blood ran out from the tangled mass of limbs and trunks and sank into the gray dust, which absorbed it like blotting paper. Suddenly to our left a raging fire broke out in a cluster of four or five sheds. Its smoke and heat climbed into the sky, and a huge sheet of flame quivered and grew with astounding speed, giving off giant wreaths of black smoke and intense heat which we could feel even where we were. Our men surged back rapidly from that quarter. The metal roofs of the sheds buckled in the heat, and the izbas closest to the fire burst into flame. A horde of Russians, both civilian and military, ran from the burning buildings. Our soldiers shot them down like rabbits. One of our shells must have hit a gasoline dump. The resulting inferno routed the panic-stricken enemy, who paid dearly for having concentrated so many men beside such a volcano. Their men rushed through the confusion with their hands in the air, occasionally remembering the way to other Russian entrenchments. Our pox were now concentrating their fire on the area immediately surrounding the factory, and the job of cleaning up the people running from the gasoline dump was left to us. The foresight of my gun often disappeared in a swiftly moving Russian silhouette. A light pressure on the trigger, a puff of smoke which for an instant veiled the end of my weapon, and my Mauser looked for another victim. Will I be forgiven? Was I responsible? That young Muzhik, already wounded several times, more bewildered than anything else by the lethal uproar whose purpose was as obscure to him as it was to me, who stayed in my sights a moment too long and then turned ashen and clutched his breast with both hands, before making a half-turn and falling face down onto the ground. Shall I ever deserve pardon for that? Can I ever forget? But the almost drunken exhilaration which follows fear induces the most innocent youths on whatever side to commit inconceivable atrocities. Suddenly, for us, as it had been for Ivan a moment before, everything that moved through the din and the smoke became hateful and overwhelmed us with a desire for destruction, a desire which led many soldiers to their deaths as they pursued the panic-stricken enemy. Our big guns pulverized the top end of the village where the Russian artillery had dug in. In the general flight, the few wretched hovels which had not been burned fell, one by one, into our young criminal hands. We ran full speed over ground which might have been mined. Nothing could stop us. Nothing stopped my good friend Howells from jumping across a stable threshold and shooting the Russian gunners, who were desperately trying to fire their jammed weapon. Nothing could stop the glorious 8th and 14th companies of German infantry. As the communiques later observed, with an irresistible thrust, our valiant troops retook the town of X this morning. Nothing could stop our demoniac assault, not even the rending cries of Obergefreiter Wartenbeck, who clenched his trembling hands on an iron grill and stiffened himself against the death which flooded from the bloody pulp which had once held his entrails. A few more of our comrades were destroyed before we reached the factory. At that point, the pack stopped firing to spare our own troops, who were right beside the Soviet defenders. The Russians clung stubbornly to what they still had, particularly to the sector immediately around the factory. I no longer remember exactly what happened. My group joined the veteran and his men, who were snatching a few moments of rest in a large cement settling tank.
We all emptied our water bottles without quenching our thirst. Everyone was covered with dust. A telephone operator settled down beside us and spoke with Group Commandant Wes Rydow. The fighting had died down somewhat, and the German troops were regrouping for the final assault. The veteran section had a mortar as well as its two FMs. Ours consisted of grenadiers armed with machine guns and rifles. Our sergeant placed us down the length of the cistern, specifying the points we should try to reach once the attack had started. We agreed to do as he asked before there was time for our terror to grow uncontrollable. These moments of waiting were often the hardest of all. A group of Russians suddenly appeared, climbing through some dismantled scaffolding near the factory, waving a white cloth. There must have been at least sixty of them, all civilians, probably factory workers. Maybe they were partisans and afraid of execution. They walked up to the veterans' men and turned themselves in. The anxiety stamped across every man's face lent great pathos to the moment. The veteran, who was fluent in Russian, talked to them. Protected by the white cloth, four of our men took the prisoners to the rear. It was one of those odd moments of calm, when it almost seemed as if a few friendly words between the adversaries might produce a settlement, which would have allowed all of us to sit down and have a drink. But in the madness of our existence, the most simple things eluded us. Everyone was absorbed by immediate necessities. Most of us never even thought of the symbolic value of the steps those men had just taken, first steps back to the essentials of life. Even the exceptions to this general insensibility kept their wild eyes glued to the metallic wreckage of the factory, which we would soon be obliged to attack and enter. Animals, which have a stronger instinctive sense than human beings, turn and run from a fire. But we, the elect among living creatures, press forward like moths to a candle. That is what we call courage, a quality I lack. Fear knotted my throat and I felt like a sheep at the threshold of the slaughterhouse. I'm sure I wasn't the only one who had this feeling. The fellow beside me stared at me for a moment from his blackened face and murmured, if only those bastards would give up. But our feelings, of course, were unimportant. The trench telephone rang and crackled out an order. One third of the men forward, count off by threes. One, two, three, one, two, three. Like a miracle from heaven, I drew a one and could stay in that splendid cement hole which at that moment seemed to me as magnificent as any palace. It was a secure refuge in which I would have spent my days in gratitude so long as death was stalking outside. I cut off a smile, in case the sergeant should notice and send me onto the field, but inwardly thanked God, and Allah, and Buddha, and heaven, earth, water, fire, trees, anything I could think of that I was in that cement depression, which had held God knows what kind of filth before it sheltered me. The fellow beside me had number three. He was looking at me with a long, desperate face, but I kept my eyes turned front, so he wouldn't notice my joy and relief, and stared at the factory as if it were I who was going to leap forward, as if I were number three, but in fact everything was normal. Dry was my neighbor. He was going to inspect the factory. Then the sergeant made his fatal gesture, and the brave German soldier beside me sprang from his shelter with a hundred others. Immediately we heard the sound of Russian automatic weapons. Before vanishing to the bottom of my hole, I saw the impact of the bullets, raising little fountains of dust all along the route of my recent companion, who would never again contemplate the implications of number three. The noise of guns and grenades was deafening and almost drowned the cries of the fellows who'd been hit. Achtung, number zwei voraus! The veteran and his Spandau ran up in turn. Next it was going to be me along with everybody else who'd counted one. While everything outside was flashing and exploding, I thought for a moment about numbers. Usually people begin counting with one. Why had they started with three this time? But I could only pose the question. Before there was time to consider it, my turn had come. Number eins nach gehen los. After a moment of hesitation, I sprang from my shelter like a jack-in-the-box into madness. Everything looked gray, through a thick fog of whirling, choking dust, except for the glimmering flashes of light. In a few jumps, I had reached the foundation of a shattered hut where a German soldier had died, staring at the open breech of his machine gun. It's strange how often human beings die without any kind of style. Two years before, I had seen a woman run over by a milk truck and had nearly fainted at the sight of her mangled body. Now, after two years in Russia, visible death meant nothing at all.
and the tragic element of even the best murder novels seemed petty and frivolous. With my watering eyes, I stared through the smoke, trying to see the enemy and do my duty. About twenty-five yards away, some trucks exploded into little fragments, one after the other, engulfing four or five running soldiers. Were the men German or Russian, I couldn't tell. I was with two companions in an open shelter made of logs packed with dirt, which the Russians had built to take a machine gun. We were more or less sitting on the mangled bodies of the four Popovs who'd been killed by grenades. I did that bunch in with one shot, shouted a strong young soldier from the Gross Deutschland. A burst of mortar fire forced us down into the heap of enemy corpses. A shell hit the edge of the bunker and the earth and logs blew apart, falling back onto our heads. The fellow huddled between me and a dead Russian was hit. As his body jerked up from the impact, I tensed myself to run. Another shell struck the shelter, disintegrating it. The debris poured down onto my legs and sent me reeling back against the opposite wall. I howled for help, sure that my legs were broken and afraid to move. My trousers were ripped down the leg, but the bruised skin underneath was unbroken, although I could trace the red-violet passage of the blow I'd taken. I plunged back into the heap of Russian corpses falling onto the fellow who'd been hit a moment before. He let out a howl. We lay side by side with our heads touching as an avalanche of rubble poured down all around us. I'm wounded, he groaned, and something is burning in my back. Call for a stretcher. I looked at him and dazedly shouted, Sanftentrager. But my ludicrous cries were lost in the deafening uproar of two Spandaus firing quite near us. The big fellow from the Gross Deutschland was shouting at us to advance as loud as he could. Come on, fellows, some of our boys are already at the water tank. I looked at the wounded man who was staring at me with desperate, imploring eyes and clutching my sleeve. I didn't know how to tell him that there was nothing I could do for him just then. The big soldier had jumped out of the shelter. I pulled myself brutally away and turned my head. The wounded man called again, but I had already jumped from the shelter and was running like a madman after the other fellow, who was nearly fifteen yards ahead of me. I joined another group who were hurriedly setting up two trench mortars and helped them maneuver the tubes into position. Instantly our mortar bombs were shooting almost straight up. A lancer, whose face was pouring blood, shouted that the Russians had withdrawn to the central tower. The veteran, whom I hadn't noticed before, let out a savage howl. Got him! As he shouted, a white flash lit his face, which was covered with an incredible layer of dust, and a geyser of flame enveloped the tower. The Russian defense crumbled and fell under the impact of our concentrated fire. Our assault groups moved in and cleaned up the last resistance. Another German soldier fell, clutching his face. And then, it was all over, except for a few widely scattered shots. I and my companions ran into the ruins of what had once been a factory but was now reduced to rubble beyond classification. Once again we were victorious. But the victory gave us no joy. Stupefied by the noise and the nervous tension, we wandered among the twisted, collapsed metal roofs. A lancer, with a face drawn by exhaustion, mechanically picked up an enameled plaque, which had something written on it in Cyrillic characters, perhaps a direction or the word for toilet. The town had fallen to us. There were about 300 prisoners, in addition to 200 enemy dead or wounded. The non-coms regrouped us and led us back through the smoking devastation of the village. Herr Hauptmann Wes Rydau reviewed his two companies and called roll. About 60 men were missing. We collected the wounded, and regrouped them to wait for our three orderlies to give them first aid. There were about fifteen wounded men, including Holen Grauer, whose right eye was gone. Finding water was difficult. The prekas had been smashed, and we finally had to lower soup kettles down a well in the ashes of one of the isbeas. The water was black with soot. The wounded were screaming with pain. Most of them were delirious. There were also about seventy-five Russian wounded who presented a dilemma to our commandant. In principle, we should have helped them too as best we could, but we were under orders to rejoin our division as soon as the operation was completed. So we abandoned the Russian wounded and piled ours into and on to the vehicles we had, which bore no resemblance to ambulances or even to ordinary trucks. A few gun carriages and a couple of light artillery tractors, we felt exhausted, disgusted, and numb. There was also the question of how to move the prisoners. There was no room in our collection of already overloaded vehicles. Finally, a sidecar fitted with an FM slowly drove some fifty of the prisoners along a hit of it.
We turned them loose two days later, for lack of anything better to do with them. As an autonomous group, we were faced with extremely difficult problems of supply. In theory, the vehicles carrying munitions and gasoline picked up the flotsam of war as their loads grew lighter. But the division already had some 1,100 prisoners and we didn't know what to do with them. We set off with clusters of men, German and Russian, hanging on to everything that could roll. We all looked back at the town from which a thick cloud of smoke was climbing and spreading out to the horizon. The dark gray sky was threatening rain, which would soon fall on the graves of 40 German soldiers sacrificed to neutralize a single point of enemy resistance, which we weren't even interested in holding. We moved on to another operation, not as part of any design to conquer, but simply as part of an attempt to protect our vast withdrawal of troops to the west bank of the Dnieper. No one smiled. We knew that our victory couldn't make any difference to the outcome of the war, and only hoped that it might have some strategic interest. The experience of the battle itself had been, as always, more fear and, for some, like my friend Grauer, irreparable mutilation. A young blonde soldier, huddled beside the driver of the machine which was carrying about thirty of us, began to play on his harmonica. The melody rang softly in our nearly insensible ears. Mit dir, Lily Marlene, mit dir, Lily Marlene. The music was slow and filled with a nostalgia which weighed heavily on our exhaustion. Hals was listening, his mouth hanging half open, making no sound and staring at nothing.